I have, uh, I'm just going to make a confession here at this point, but I, to set up a question, um, before, I mean, I have been thrown out of an organization called the Marxist Humanist Initiative. So I'm no longer involved with the Marxist Humanist, Humanist Initiative, but you may know Andrew Kleiman. You, I know you know who Andrew Kleiman is. Yeah. And, um, for someone who is coming from that perspective, the notion that um, value, the that labor, the, the labor theory value, could hold in a society without market forces uh, is a bit of a puzzle, right? But I, I wonder if this might be a good time for um, you to tell me about how you think. Um, uh, and it goes into my question that I sent you about equality, about um, how you started your book um, on new, on the new socialism uh, based on uh, the question of inequality. Um, do you think that in Maoist China, if there had been less private ownership, that there would have been a way to create a system uh, of uh, through a planned economy where people would receive back from the, the society what they put into it in terms of their labor time. Well, that, that was the, what was actually directly put into practice in the countryside in the communes. Mm -hmm. Right. It and then was, how was that done? Was that done with like uh, labor certificates that was like one hour of work equals work one labor points, certificate? Work points that were registered. I don't know whether it was day's work or hours work. Hello, Sublation Media viewers and listeners. You're about to watch a, an interview with Paul Cockshot. Cockshot is a computer scientist. He is a, a reader at the University of Glasgow. And since 1993, he's authored many books, most notably Towards a New Socialism. In the second half, in the Parrot Room, you'll hear more of, of the conversation, and it will start off with a conversation around the uh, critique of the Gotha program and uh, labor certificates and just uh, how uh, socialism uh, might, might work. The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning, and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see... We still, to a large extent, live in the interregnum between, between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. Yeah, the first question is, how, how, how did you come to be a Marxist? Firstly, I was already from early teenage years a social democrat because my stepfather was a, a labor party member and uh, and became whilst I was at school a Labour MP mm -hmm. uh, and there were lots of actually I re later realised I didn't realise this as a, a schoolboy that he had lots of books on the shelves which were actually Marxist books which I didn't read until I went to university mm. um, I was influenced in my later years at school by the Cultural Revolution in China and the events in Paris in 68. Mm -hmm. Because that, those happened when I was still at school. So that uh, the first thing I did when I went to university, which was actually in Canada, was to join the, the the first student group I saw that had um, a left-wing stall out on the freshest day. So um, were you in university in Canada in May of 68? 
No, I was at school in 68. I went to university in 69. What is your memory? Because I'm I'm very interested in, you know, I, I was born in 70, so it's not as though um, May of 68 is a living memory for me, but um, but it is, a, I think of it as one of the last moments um, where the revolution, the idea of revolution in the developed world seemed plausible. Like seemed like oh, it, no, no. Yeah. it was much more plausible in 1975 in Portugal. This was May Day in Lisbon, one week after the regime of Marcelo Caetano was destroyed in a military coup. An infectiously happy people celebrated the restoration of freedoms taken from them almost 50 years ago. Exactly what Bordiga predicted in the ni- in 1945. Oh yeah, uh, tell me more about that. Well, he, he said there's a there's a um, a democratic euphoria has overtaken Europe after 45, and it will take 30 years. And the first serious attempt at a, a socialist revolution in Europe won't occur until 1975. He died in 72. Hmm. And what did he mean by democratic euphoria exactly? Well, he you've you got to realize that Bordiga was more Leninist than Lenin, okay? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that the Communist Party of Italy, when he read, led it, had a principle of abstention from elections. But mm-hmm. he, he, he regarded the... Uh, electoral system as a fraud, and that it was just a, a, a disguised form of the dictatorship of capital, mm-hmm. and that the the effect of the overthrow of Mussolini was to generate a revived belief in the old state system. Okay, but in '68 in Paris, um, there wasn't really an electoral component to the actions in the streets. No, the workers. but the, the reason why it was nothing like as serious as the situation in Portugal was mm-hmm. that to have a, a revolution, you need a mass movement. Yes. But you also, and this is absolutely critical, you need the army to mutiny. And Portugal, the army mutinied as a result of effectively being defeated in the long war in Angola and Mozambique. And it was revolutionary soldiers that created the opportunity there. Now, in fact, social democrats the Socialist Party turned it back into just constitutional um, capitalist state. But there was real possibility of a state of workers' councils there because there actually was um, equivalent to military Soviets. Okay. Um, but, but when you were a young man before the revolutionary efforts in Portugal, you were still inspired by the 68, and you were learning, you were just beginning to... As a schoolboy, that, that yeah. uh, and probably the year before, watching the Cultural Revolution in China and getting a copy of the Little Red Book, I mean, at that stage, it was the first Marxist text I actually read. Um, mm-hmm. It wasn't until... I went to university that I started to read other things. When I was um, a younger man, uh, back in the early 90s, I discovered 
the Situationist International, and we started to read Geta Board and I read about the 68. That was how the ideas uh, and the and the uh, history of, of May of 68 in Paris came to me. It was through um, books on the Situationists, which included like Ryle Marcus's book, um, Lipstick Traces, which was this. It's like a book about punk rock. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, you wouldn't know it necessarily. It's not a it's not a significant political book. It's a, a book about culture and pop culture. Originally, I heard about the Situationist when I was at art school, looking for a cause, like every other rebel without one. When it became time in the mid-70s to change pop music, when pop fans like Malcolm McLaren and Jamie Reed were disgusted, bored to death with the deadness of pop life, situationist notions of change, of outrage, of excess, were a lot of what drove them to try and create the Sex Pistols. I thought of May 68 as a revolution inspired by this little, you know, uh, art group in Paris, but... Um, there was a, a major Maoist component to the... There was a Maoist component, yes. Um, a strong Maoist component, because it, it was occurring at the time of the Cultural Revolution, and that mm -hmm. had an enormous intellectual impact beyond China. And um, what was most exciting to you about the uh, Cultural Revolution in, in, in China? Well, you, you've got to taking into account that you gradually learned about, or I gradually learned about it, or people more in the West gradually learned about it. First of all, you saw was these big demonstrations and uh, news broadcasts of, of what was going on. Only later did you start reading things published uh, in China, like the Peking Review. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't so I started to read that and also some of the comments, the analysis of it by the French Maoist groups. Um, I'm now talking about 73, 74, uh, what, the, what they were saying about it, um, what, uh, yeah, the, 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 there was, the ideas would be, um, gradually filtering through to the rest of the world what it really meant in terms of having control of factories and things being by um, committees run by the old managers and the uh, the slogans and uh, being masters of the wharf not slaves to production for instance, from the dockers so you look back on the Cultural Revolution now as a moment where something like workers' councils and worker control was was uh, beginning to happen? Yes, it was. The problem is they didn't actually settle on a state form that was suitable. Mm -hmm. The state form that would be required would be some form of direct democracy. And um, the, there was no attempt to actually have a overthrow of the PRC constitution towards that. Uh, you can't have a political movement, a revolutionary political movement, unless it has definite constitutional aims of changing the existing constitution as it exists, as, as it stands. And they didn't have that. It, 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 it was ad hoc struggles at, at, at each particular point. But unless you change the constitution, overthrow the, the then existing constitution, this, mm. the possibility to revert back remained. Because well, the, 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 if you read the PRC constitution, mm -hmm. it's very, very close to the uh, model of um, constitution that is set out as the archetypal workers' council 
hierarchical Soviet type constitution. Um, it's it's, it's uh, local elections to local bodies, which then elect people to, um, you know, from county level to a larger level, and etc. Now that became the orthodoxy for a, what a Marxist constitution could be as a result of Marx's writing on the civil war in France. But what he's describing there is actually the program of the French Prudenists, which was an updated version of the um, what was achieved in, in the, the, the first French Revolution. It's essentially a hierarchical um, election system. But the problem with the hierarchical election system is it gives an enormous advantage to whichever political party is the largest. Because each layer of the hierarchy increases the disproportionate share of that party. Hmm. Um, we are just about to publish an essay on the Cultural Revolution um, next week, I think. Um, it's written by uh, a man who is Chinese and who lived through it as a, as a boy. Um, and he describes... Uh, the Cultural Revolution is coming out of the failures of the Great Leap Forward. Um, and he, he he describes these the fighting and um, the disorder uh, 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 that he saw uh, during the Cultural Revolution in, in kind of vivid detail. Um, and he, he thinks of the difficulties... Uh, that the failure of the Cultural Revolution and the Great Leap Forward is, is arriving be because the internal culture of the party was not democratic enough, that there wasn't a process of internal critique, there was a process of, of evaluation that was cut short, um, and that, uh, you know, a, a culture of conformity and um, arose where there should have been a, a culture of... Uh, collective thinking through of problems. What would you make of, of that? I get your point. Um, the problem is that it's a mistake to focus just on discussions within a party. It has to be something that involves the whole population. And you have and that was something which the um, cultural revolution was starting and was involving people outside the party. But the they didn't settle on a form of constitution which wouldn't repeatedly allow the established party bureaucracy to completely dominate it. Although the, the, the PRC constitution appears a very democratic constitution, its fatal flaw is the hierarchical character of the election system. And the, the, the nonsense is that if you look at what most leftists in Britain or America were saying as critique of the USSR way back in, in, in the 70s or, or later than that, what they were saying, oh, they needed to... It, establish a proper Soviet democracy. And by that, they mean the system of hierarchical elections, which um, was advocated by Lenin in State and Revolution, but that is actually what they had. Uh, and if, if they, and that's what the Chinese certainly had, and that accentuates the power of the, uh, a well-established party. So, um, so what kind of uh, democratic system would you think should have been outlined again in the in the constitute in a in a functional constitution? The key, the key the principle revolution? has to be that um, representative bodies are selected by lot, not by election. Otherwise, you always get dominance by the most prepared and the, those with the what. Nowadays, people say had the most social capital. 
this is a, a selection by lot would be kind of a a random approach to selecting your yes it has to be random but it, if you consider any scientific sampling process you always do it randomly if you consider any surveying company that wants to find out what the the population's view is or if you're trying to do um you know um a medical trial or anything like that you always have to take a yeah but Theory. Right, but but on the other hand, if you have to have a surgery performed, you, if you wouldn't you have want. To have one? Yeah, if, if you're going to go, undergo surgery, you don't want to select your surgeon uh, by no, lot. That, but that's not politics. That 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 mm -hmm. is um, that's particular technical skills. Right. You so don't, you're, you don't select surgeons either. No, we don't. And the idea, I guess, that I guess there's just something's crept into contemporary politics, which is the idea that politicians are policy experts or they either refer no, not. to. I have a plan for Medicare for all. I have a plan. I have a plan. I have a plan. What the experts tell us is that one of the reasons that we are unprepared and have been unprepared is we don't have a system. Your education is incredible. Uh, you're, you're, you're a military man, lauded as a mayor. But were you specifically interested in transportation? Or was it one of those things that we think you'd be a good fit and then you do the diligence to, to get prepared? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, when you're a mayor, you live and breathe transportation in so many ways, right? Because it, it's it's the, the lifeblood of a city. Anytime we do anything, we try to learn from experience. We learned a lot from the first program from your comments. First, you wanted better charts that you could see the fine print on, and you'll have those tonight. If you're going to say anything that you need experts, well, the, the Chinese uh, Communist Party works that way. Right, right. I mean, yeah. the, 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 the people who, the, that's what the Chinese Communist Party would say, that the people who are at the head of the party uh, arrive at that through going through a very rigorous selection process or been tested as um, political leaders at a local scale and then a scale, a city scale and then at a provincial scale before they're uh, trusted to do anything at a national level. So if you want political experts, well, that's the system that'll give it to you. My understanding of the Cultural Revolution was that it was aimed at stamping out bourgeois ideology um, and and in creating a proletarian or a communist culture. Um, and unleash, but it, but it, but it, you're you're suggesting, and this is you know important to underscore that it was beyond that, also aiming to turn over the um, productive capacities of China to the workers. It's absolutely central. If you read the propaganda that was being published mm -hmm. um, in Peking Review or China Reconstructs, if you go and look at back issues of those from the early 70s, of, uh, from, say from 69 to, to 72, that was very definitely what they were on about. Okay. They what do you that you could increase production more by harnessing the knowledge and initiative of shop floor workers? Do you believe that the cultural side, the the uh, effort to stamp out um, uh, ideological experts or uh, the bourgeois culture, um, was a necessary component to uh, a, a process of collectivizing and? and turning over the uh, factories and other uh, workplaces to the workers? Well, yes, because you couldn't realize that until 67 or 68, until the start of the Cultural Revolution, China was still running a mixed economy. It was running a social democratic mixed economy. There was a large private capitalist sector What it, that was what... Uh, uh, Mao following Lenin called state capitalists. That is to say, they were capitalists, but they had to meet certain objectives set by the state. Mm -hmm. But they still. And there was a lot of, a lot of and false they, reporting 
um, Sorry? Uh, there was a lot of false reporting about those meeting those objectives. Uh, I've heard that they're false that reporting. The, yeah, people would say, oh, yeah, we've met our quota, we're succeeding yeah, our but quota. That's, but that's separate from the issue I'm talking about. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the fact that the ownership of a large part of the industry in China was still private until the end of the 60s. Mm -hmm. the, and they would be paid by the state. No, um, they, and they were running no? factories and, and they, were, they were selling the product. To now, the state, right? No. Some no. would go to the state, some would go to other factories. Some would be sold directly to consumers. Okay, all right, all right. It wasn't a Soviet-type economy. Right, okay. The, and... the, there was a state sector, mm -hmm. but that coexisted alongside a private sector. And this was reverted to by Deng mm -hmm. after Mao died. What? Deng was doing was reverting to the system that had existed up until 1966. Now, one of the things of the Cultural Revolution was a nationalized industry. Okay. It wasn't till then that the actual private bourgeoisie were expropriated. So it wasn't just culture, it was economics as well. The economic reforms during the Great Leap Forward increased centralized state control, to the extent that private ownership became virtually impossible. By 1956, approximately two-thirds of industrial enterprises were state-owned, while the remainder were jointly owned. Rigid central planning and national demands often resulted in local needs being neglected, especially in the countryside. While 84% of the population lived in rural areas, 88% of government investment was pumped into heavy industry in towns and cities. The state monopoly on grain and the impact of collectivization also caused disruption and dissatisfaction in rural areas in the mid-1950s. Many questioned whether the struggling countryside could feed the rapidly expanding cities. As the state diverted grain supply, Grain reserves fell, causing food shortages and hunger in some places. New farming techniques and technologies, used with success elsewhere in Asia, were largely ignored. Okay, so the um, the Great Leap Forward then was not a process of, of collectivizing and and taking up uh, through the state the um, say the agricultural sector of society or or the um, industrial side. It was not controlled it was a mixed economy a mixed economic well, model that, that was, the, the great leap forward was an agricultural issue okay it was a countryside issue it was setting up communes as combined local industry small-scale local industry and agriculture in larger units than collective farms and within which the actual production relations were not wage labor. Um, and they had a work point system that, that, that people were given labor credits for the amount of work they did, and then the harvest was then devoted in proportion to that. Right. Um, and and the the industrial sector was um, was mixed. It was some some of it was state controlled, some of it was privately owned. Is that right? The, the state sectors were the there were state sectors where there was new state investment in new industries, but the old what called the, the pro progressive national bourgeoisie, the ones who had sided with the CPC run with the Guomintang were allowed to keep their factories. Those who sided with the Guomintang had their factories confiscated. Okay. Um, so so do, it sounds to me like, as we've discussed this, that you hold on to quite a great deal of the Maoism that you uh, came across in your youth, that you are still looking back on it, well, rightly so, 
to critically, but also with some hope in certain aspects of, of that history, oh, right? The, the, the political strength of the left and of workers suffered heavily in China in the late 70s. And this reflected a, a split that always been in the CPC because of its, the nature it had of a patriotic alliance against the Japanese, that it had within it sections who were supportive of the progressive national bourgeoisie and supported the private ownership. And the, if you look back at um, the polemic that took place between the Chinese and the Russians in the early 60s, um, and you will see that they, in the Cultural Revolution, Liu Shanxi is accused of being China's Khrushchev. Actually, the critique of Khrushchev a few years earlier should be seen in the light of a critique by Mao and Zhao Enlai, swing of the Communist Party, of Liu Xiaoqi's wing of the Communist Party. Rather than openly critique Liu Xiaoqi, they attack Khrushchev. And the code is that what Khrushchev is advocating is a sign for what Liu Xiaoqi is advocating, and the opposition to Khrushchev is an opposition to Liu Xiaoqi's economic policies. Was and there some alliance? Was there some alliance between Khrushchev and Li? No. The point is that from Khrushchev onwards, there was in Russia and in Eastern Europe an ideological process of re-justifying the market and extending market economy mechanisms. And this is heavily criticized in the documents of what were called the gen critique of the general line of the, the, the communist movement. And these, these I think, um, are now believe, well, last I heard that they were written by either Zhao Enlai or by um, Mao. And th these economic policies are heavily critiqued. And the most clear critique of them comes up when they criticize the most developed form of that, which is in Tito's Yugoslavia. And if you go back, I, I no longer have copies of them, but you, you could find them in a library. If you go back to the, um, the Chinese Communist Party's critique of Tito's policies, this is essentially a critique of the people who want to have a stronger market element in China, and those are the people. The, those are the people who won out after 1975. The people who want a stronger market element and to create what is essentially a mixed economy that they have in in um, China. So the Chinese economy is like Harold. Um, I have, uh, I'm just going to make a confession here at this point, but I, to set up a question, um, before, I mean, I have been thrown out of an organization called the Marxist Humanist Initiative. So I'm no longer involved with the Marxist Humanist, Humanist Initiative, but you may know Andrew Kleiman. You, I know you know who Andrew Kleiman is. Yeah. And, um, for someone who is coming from that perspective, the notion that um, value 
the the labor the, the labor theory of value could hold in a society without market forces uh, is a bit of a puzzle, right? But I uh, I wonder if this might be a good time for um, you to tell me about how you think. Um, uh, and it goes into my question that I sent you about equality, about um, how you started your book um, on new, on the new socialism uh, based on uh, the question of inequality. Um, do you think that in Maoist China, if there had been less private ownership, that there would have been a way to create a system uh, of uh, through a planned economy where people would receive back from the, the society what they put into it in terms of their labor time. Well, that, that was the, what was actually directly put into practice in the countryside in the communes. Mm -hmm. Right. It and then was, how was that done? Was that done with like uh, labor certificates? That was like one hour of work equals one points, labor certificate? points that were registered. I don't know whether it was day's work or hours work. Mm -hmm. But and um, and, and so go ahead. Would be, this anymore. would be recorded, and people would be credited with that amount. And the it was still it was a largely in kind system that the share of the harvest and the, the the locally produced goods that they got would be proportional to the labor they put in. If you enjoyed this conversation please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both.